Cultivating Futures is about the people that were, are, and are going to be here. This department sets you up for greatness. I think in addition to cultivating futures, they, they cultivate confidence in their students. Whether you love the agriculture side or love the leadership and education side, I think that's something that the department really bonds together really well. I think this department cultivates legacy. They change your life while you're here for those four years. They take you, they mold you, and they help you do what you want to do. It cultivates people. It cultivates relationships. It builds a foundation. It gives you a strong foundation for just about any career that you want to go into. I really feel touched by the opportunity to have been a part of what I consider a pretty special place. O-H! O-H! Uh, that's always nice to say in a, in a crowd of Buckeyes. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the centennial celebration of the Department of Agricultural Communication, Education, and Leadership at The Ohio State University. I'm Tracy Kitchell, professor and chair of the department, and I'm thrilled that you were able to take the opportunity to join us for this momentous occasion that has been a little over 100 years in the making. When Ohio State created the Department of Agricultural Education on July 1st, 1917, it was created with a primary focus to train vocational agriculture teachers. Little did major players like Dean Alfred Vivian and President William Oxley Thompson know that our department would expand its mission to what it is today. In 1955, that expansion would start with the addition of extension education. 50 year, years ago, in 1969, the college would build an agricultural journalism program that would be our ag communication major uh, in our department in 1983. In the 1980s, we were teaching our first courses that is now part of the community leadership program. The mid-1990s ushered our rural sociology colleagues who would later find a home in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. The addition of rural sociology also initiated a name change to the Department of Human and Community Resource Development, or HCRD. In December 2011, after rural sociology moved to SCNR, we changed our department name to what we have affectionately referred to today as ACEL. And in 2012, during the quarter to semester conversion, we changed our majors at the undergraduate levels to include agricultural communication, agri-science education, and community leadership. So whether you knew us as Ag Ed, HCRD, or ACEL, welcome home. Our theme for the centennial is cultivating futures. The word cultivate has several meanings or connotations. The first definition ties us to our agricultural roots, to prepare and work on land in order to raise crops. And the second more literal definition is to, promote or to, is to promote the growth of and development of or to foster. And it ties us to action. As we put, together, as we put that together, we look to promote the growth and development of people's futures, our students and stakeholders, communicators, educators, and leaders. Although my fellow social scientists in the college may take offense, I often refer to ACEL as being the people department of the college, as everything we do from our department, from top to bottom, from teaching, research, and outreach, all centrally involve people. We take very seriously our role in cultivating the human and community capital in others and have done so for 100 years. Our centennial celebration is definitely paying homage to our first 100 years as a department, but it is much more than that. It's an opportunity to think about and hope for the future of the department as well. It's an opportunity to connect with our ACEL family in ways that we've never done. We hope that the centennial marks an even better relationship with our students, alumni, and stakeholders that will carry us into the next 100 years. This evening is a storytelling. We will hear the story of this department as it was, as it is, and how we hope it to be. In particular, we will hear from the six living department chairs about the changes in the department over time. We will also hear from students and alumni about their experiences as they bring the department to life from the viewpoint of being a student. 
we will also debut the centennial video, talk about future plans, and launch an exciting campaign designed to help us not only sustain, but excel over the next 100 years. After dinner, our student narrators will introduce our special guests, but there are two groups that I would like the honor personally to introduce. So first, would the members of the Centennial Committee and the Advancement Subcommittee please stand and remain standing? So we have Trina Beebe, Emily Wickham, Tom Stewart, Cindy Brill, Ellen Gilliland, Mary Kivel, Hallie Wells, Kirby Barrick, Mary Seekman, Jackie Deeds, Rick Rudd, Barbara Kirby, Claire Badger, Susie Whittington, Emily Winnenberg, Andy Gerd, and Cody McLean. Dr. Barrick will talk a little bit later on, uh, on Dr. Whittington's very excused absence for the evening. Our, our team also included our friends from Burkholder Flint Agency who developed our centennial theme and helped us build the public relations around the centennial. So I know Julie is here, Julie Hamlin. So Julie Stand is here, but we also worked with Bob Wiseman and the late Vicki Easterday uh, as a part of our work. These individuals had to put up with a new department chair uh, during a very busy time. Uh, you all have been very patient with me, uh, and most importantly, I appreciate your dedication uh, to ensuring that this centennial is special for everybody here. So please join me in thanking the Centennial Committee. And the second group I would like to recognize is actually our College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences as a whole. The college and its administrative team has been very supportive of ACEL. And in relation to this evening, they provided generous funding to help support our year's worth of centennial celebrations. So please join me in thanking Dean Kress, who we'll hear from later, and our college for their support of the centennial. Thank you. Finally, I'm gonna end my introductory comments with this thought. We have great people who are and have been a part of this department. People who have been responsible for changing the course of action for our industry, for our profession, for young people, for adults, and for communities. I do not have to be the department chair to say that I'm a proud, I am proud to be an alum of ACEL. I have carried my Buckeye pride through Missouri and Kentucky, and that being said, it wasn't until I re returned home, though, where I work in the middle, uh, the day in and the day out of the department, that it was affirmed to me how special this place, this department, continues to be. We've still got that magic that I still remember as an undergraduate, and we are absolutely committed to ensuring that the second century is as, as exciting as the first. And before I move forward with introducing our narrators, uh, I do have, there were two special presentations that were made. First, we received a commendation from the Ohio House of Representatives, and this was from Representative David Leland. And so we have a special commendation from the House for our centennial. And then we actually have a full resolution from the Ohio Senate denoting our centennial. So give them a round of applause. So at this time, I'm going to turn the program over to Brianna. Homecoming is a busy time, and that's certainly true for our university leadership. Before he heads to his next event, we have the pleasure to hear from Ohio State's Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Bruce McFerrin. Dr. McFerrin is Executive Vice President and Provost of The Ohio State University. Dr. McFerrin's leadership more specifically includes oversight of 15 colleges, five campuses, and more than 7,000 faculty. In addition, he oversees academic programs for over 66,000 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, more than 200 majors, and almost 13,000 courses. A professor of entomology, he has taught undergraduate and graduate courses, including courses in international agriculture. His research has focused on the use of genetic tools to examine population structure and in pest insects of global quarantine significance and resulted in extensive fieldwork on multiple continents. 
Prior to joining Ohio State's faculty in 2012 as the Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean of our college, he previously served as Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. McFerrin earned his bachelor's degree from The Ohio State University and his master's degree and doctorate from the University of Illinois. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McFerrin for some brief comments. Thank you, Brianna, and good evening, everyone. You know, Tracy, the only thing more fun than saying OH in a group like this is to say it once at that university up north. <laughs> they don't know quite what to make of it. Actually, they know exactly what to make of it. <laughs> and they're not necessarily very polite in their response. So uh, maybe it is a joy to say it in, in an environment like this. Wow. Great to be with you. Happy birthday. You don't look a day over 99. I saw a couple of my colleagues looking at posters out there, and I couldn't tell if they were reliving their history of, of the department or looking for themselves. And then I realized it was the 1917 to 1927 panel and, and crossed my fingers that they were looking at the history of the department. You know, I came back to uh, Penn State five years ago now as dean of this college, and uh, knowing full well that not only the department but the college has undergone a lot of change through time and and uh, a shifting of names etc but this department has in many ways landed at this time on absolutely the perfect descriptors of what a university and an education are all about communication education and leadership we just had a forum last week with our academic leaders from across the university. And wouldn't you know it, at that leadership forum, we talked about communication as the driving importance in a strong education. And here we are back again celebrating a department that, whatever it's been called over the years, has actually always anchored to those principles. I came to Ohio State as a student because I already knew Ohio State before I was a student. My leaders in 4-H were directly anchored to education in this department. And so when this Buckeye turned into a bug guy, <laughs> it was going to be here for sure because my entire experience was tied to this college through the education that you have provided over so many years to so many influential people around Ohio, around the nation, and around the world. As we look to the next hundred years, you know, the good thing about a birthday is you're having it, and so you can look forward to tomorrow, right? And so as we think about year 101 and beyond, uh, I would challenge you all to really build from the strength of the past. Some of you who uh, were here a few years ago, if you wake up in the morning and, you know, kind of feel stiff and sore, it's because we're standing on your shoulders, the better to see the future. And so use the springboard of a celebration like this, looking back at a century of success in a way that you can continue to lead, to communicate, and to educate the people of Ohio and beyond. Congratulations and thanks for letting me share this time this evening. It's always a pleasure to have you back home for a college event. Thank you for what you do for our department and every department at Ohio State. Blake will continue with our program. Thank you, Brianna. As we prepare for a moment of silent reflection, I would ask you all to think about your gratitude for those who have been instrumental in development of the department, the faculty and staff members who change people's lives, and the students who leave the department to be the change agents of our state, country, and world. I would also ask for each of you to reflect on the hands of those who, who have prepared our food and the wonderful industry that ensures our safe and abundant food supply. At this moment, please take a few moments of silent reflection.
Thank you. At this time, we will now enjoy dinner. You're, everyone's been waiting for this. Your food will be served at your table. Please have a small card out from the registration indicating your meal choice. Enjoy the music from the OSU School of Music, and we'll continue with the program in approximately 30 minutes. Please enjoy. We have 100 years worth of celebrating to pack into one evening, so please continue eating as Justin and I proceed with our program. Before we move on, we need to recognize two groups. We have been enjoying wonderful music during our reception and during our meal, and we are enjoying the wonderful service of the Fawcett Center staff. Please help me in thanking our musicians and our food service staff. We are honored this evening to have a number of guests in attendance. We will announce guests in groups. If you are able, please stand and remain standing until all of your group is announced. Please hold applause until each group is introduced. We have several of our former, former department chairs in attendance. Dr. J. Robert, J. Robert Warmbrode, Dr. L. H. Newcomb, Dr. R. Kirby Barrick, Dr. Robert Birkenholtz, Dr. Strackwadeen, and we also have individuals with us who have served the important role as interim department chair, Dr. Ken Martin and Dr. Graham Cochran. Thank you for your leadership of our department. Would the current faculty and staff members of the department please stand and remain standing? Let's give them a round of applause. And remain standing. <laughs> and now, would former members of the faculty and staff of the department, their spouses or significant others representing a former faculty or staff member, please stand and join our current faculty and staff. Thank you. Thank you all for your contributions in building this department in its first century. And to those who are currently faculty and staff, thank you for your work in building our department for its second century. We also have some of our leaders, current and retired, from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. As, I, as your name is read, please, please stand and remain standing. Dr. Kathy Ann Kress, Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean. Dr. Dave Benfield, Associate Vice President for Agricultural Administration. Dr. Roger Rennekamp, Associate Dean and Director of OSU Extension. Dr. Graham Cochran, Interim Senior Administrative Officer. Dr. Chris Boone, Director of the Agricultural Technical Institute. Michelle Ball, Director of CFAES Marketing and Communication. Eric Bodie, CFAES Senior F Fiscal Officer. Dr. Kathy Leckman, CFAES Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Adam Ward, CFAES Director of Government Relations. Emily Winnenberg, representing the CFAES Office of Advancement. Dr. L. H. Newcomb, Retired Senior Associate Dean and Director of Academic Programs and Professor Emeritus. Dr. Keith Smith, Retired Associate Dean and Director of OSU Extension and Professor Emeritus, Dr. Marilyn Trevs, Retired Assistant Dean. Thank you for all of your support of our department. And now would all of the alumni of the department please stand and remain standing. Some of you are doing this more than once. Now, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Remain standing, though. Yes. Because would any students of the department please stand and join the alumni? Thank you. Students are the lifeblood of the department, but more importantly, you are our family. Thank you for your dedication to this department we call home at Ohio State. 
At this time, I have the honor of introducing our dean as she approaches the stage for some brief comments on behalf of the, behalf of the college. Dr. Kath Ann Kress joined The Ohio State University on May 1st, 2017 as Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean of our college. We are especially proud to have Dean Kress here this evening as she also carries the title of Professor in the Department of Agricultural Communication, Education, and Leadership. Most recently, Dr. Kress was Vice President for Extension and Outreach and Director of the Cooperative Extension at o Iowa State University. Prior to her leadership at Iowa State, Dr. Kress was a Senior Policy Analyst of Military, Community, and Family Policy at the Department of Defense. In addition, she has served as Director of Youth Development at the National 4-H Headquarters, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and as Assistant Director for Cornell Cooperative Extension and State Program Leader at Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Dean Kress for some brief comments. Well, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be able to be here with all of you tonight on such a historic occasion. Uh, and I'm just delighted to be able to bring you all greetings from our college uh, and all of our colleagues there that make up uh, our CFAES community. Uh, this morning, uh, we started the day uh, with me uh, delivering our State of the College address. And as part of that, one of the things that I referred to was our college as the cornerstone college for The Ohio State University. Uh, and that when our university uh, came into being, how important the role of our college was, and of course, in my opinion, still is. When I thought about that, one of the things that occurred to me is how I think about this department, because I'm completely unbiased, <laughs> as being the cornerstone department, because we recognize how critically important the communication and the education of our next generation of scientists and leaders is. And so I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that. One of the other things that I talked about this morning was I talked about how really what we do as a college community is really kind of simple. Uh, we feed people, we keep them healthy, we try to help their communities to thrive, and we have great hopes that we are turning over the world to the next generation of leaders better than we found it. The role of this department in our being successful at doing that is critically important when especially we think about that next generation of leaders that we hope to turn this over to. I couldn't help but think as I came through the, the reception area out there and saw all of the wonderful displays and got to talk to some of the students and have them tell me some of the stories of those pictures and those collections that have been put together for this celebration. All the faces that you see, you know, all the people, all the students, the faculty members. And I just kept thinking about the legacy of thousands of graduates, of, of all the people who've been touched by those people who've been part of this department. The students not only here, but the students out all across the, the state and the country impacted by the educators that were prepared here. I'm sure it's an enormous number, and I'm sure it's an exponential impact. As I was thinking about the fact that this is 100 years and how auspicious that is, it reminded me of a quote that I heard one time quite early in my career that I think really applies quite well in this situation. If you think in terms of a year, plant a seed. If you think in terms of 10 years, plant trees, which we did this afternoon. But if you think in terms of 100 years, teach the people. Congratulations to the ACEL department. We're enormously proud to have such a distinguished department as part of our college community. Happy birthday. Thank you, Dean Kress, for your support of ACEL and for your leadership of our college. At this time, Blake will continue with the introduction of our panel. 
Would the five former department chairs please make their way to the left of the stage? Our first panel for this evening is a discussion of the changes in the department over time. Our panelists include the five living department chairs introduced earlier. They are, <coughs> excuse me, they are also featured in your booklets at your seats. Our former department chairs are <coughs> Dr. J. Robert Warmbron, serving as chair from 1978 to 1986. Dr. L. H. Newcomb, serving as chair from 1986 to 1989. Dr. R. Kirby Barrick, serving as chair from 1989 to 1996. Dr. Robert Birkenholtz, serving as chair from 2002 to 2009. Dr. Gary Strackledean, serving as chair from 2015, 2012 to 2015. Joining us in spirit and represented by their portraits on the stage are the former chairs who have left us. Dr. W. F. Stewart, serving as chair from 1917 to 1948. Dr. Ralph Bender, serving as chair from 1948 to 1978. And Dr. N. L. Mac McCaslin, serving as chair from 1996 to 2001. Moderating the panel is the current department chair, Dr. Tracy Kitchell, who was appointed August 1st, 2016. We're going to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the history of our department from those of us who've had the opportunity to lead it. And so I have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask uh, every chair to answer. And then uh, at that point, I have a couple other questions, um, time permitting, that will open it up to, to this group to, to respond. So uh, that's, that's going to be the order of the day for us. Uh, so we're going to start, start with Dr. Warmbrode. And the first question is, what were the department's biggest accomplishments and struggles while you were department chair. It's interesting that an accomplishment is also a struggle. <laughs> the, uh, the major, the first, I guess, accomplishment or issue we had to deal with when uh, I became chair in 1978 the history of this department has had a very stable faculty. And it so happens that those faculty members who were initially, such as Ralph Bender, Ralph Wooden, uh, Willard Wolf, etc., Leon Boucher, Gil Geiler, uh, those people were all retiring. So the three years before I was chair, Two of the, three of those people retired, and uh, the first two years when I was chair, the, uh, the remainder of them retired. So the issue was staffing the department. And this uh, took place uh, in the first uh, four or five years of the time that I was chair. Also during this time, another challenge was for faculty in general or universities in general, particularly in departments where the faculty had been male white persons. And uh, the issue was uh, for diversity of faculty in terms of gender in terms of ethnic background, etc. So therefore, the first uh, job was to, in effect, hire a number of faculty members and restaffing the department and deal with the issue of diversity among faculty. So that was one of the uh, 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 companion uh, challenge uh, a companion, I think, that we did very well in the number of faculty members who were employed uh, and the diversity of those faculty. I'm proud to say that that period of time resulted in the first women to be members of our faculty and the first African-American to be a member of our faculty. 
another challenge and opportunity during that time uh, that we chose to uh, be a challenge was to enhance the research uh, funding and the research uh, dimension of the department's mission. And uh, this had been an area that due to the organization of the college, we had never had faculty members who were funded by research funds through the Ohio Agriculture Research and Development Center. So we were finally able to begin to break that particular uh, barrier open, and hopefully that has only increased during the year. Dr. Newcomb. I'm tempted to ask you what was the question, but that would just eat up valuable time. <coughs> uh, not only did this department have a great history of stability of faculty, long-serving faculty, distinguished long-serving faculty, but it had had a tradition of long-serving administrators. 30 years for the first one, 30 years for the second one, eight years for Professor Warmbrode, and after three I was kicked out, so I don't have a lot to report. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, um, I would say, during that time, we all came to realize that um, the... Um, trajectory of the department, particularly in graduate education, was forever changed because of Bob Warmbrode and the research series that he developed. I suspect there was a time when those courses generated more credit hours to the department and college than all the other courses put together. Because of the long, hard work of Ralph Bender, Bob Warmbrode, and countless others, John Davis might have even helped a little. <laughs> uh, we were fortunate, had nothing to do with me. I, I know I didn't need to say that, you would have corrected it. But we were fortunate during this time to be recognized as the number one department in the United States. And we took cause to celebrate that. Uh, frankly, uh, with some effort and uh, attempted embarrassment, President Ed Jennings and Provost Fred Hutchinson agreed that they would be host of a reception to recognize uh, that, that great honor. So things were going really great, but the challenges was to have turnover and restaffing, and that's always a challenge. Maybe the biggest challenge I reflect about it, though, was at the stroke of a clock, we inherited a cadre of new colleagues when the National Center for Research and Vocational Education ceased being funded. In fact, the uh, college had awarded tenure to, Bob, I don't know, five or more persons who had tenure in our department. Three of them elected to come to the department, and uh, they were wonderful to work with. Mac McCaslin, Wes Budke, and... Um, Joel Magasos was with us for a few years. I remember meeting those three gentlemen on a Saturday morning to try to get this going. And from that meeting until forever, they just chipped in, found their place, and contributed enormously. And I'd finally say um, the, the, the greatest accomplishment maybe that uh, I was privileged to have was having Kirby Barrick next door. Kirby was an enormous help to me. Now, you could have said, well, Bob Warmbrode stepped down. He's your major professor. He's been your department chair. How are you going to survive as a young department chair with someone like that looking over your shoulder? Those of you who know Bob Warmbrode know that was a silly argument because, Bob, I remember more times than you'd like, I came to your office and shared my thoughts and ideas and sorrows and angst and benefited, as always, from your enormous uh, good counsel. Three themes, uh, none of them original, well, two of them not original to me. The first one was, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. <laughs> You've heard that before, right? Yeah. Uh, in, the 19, in, in the early 1980s, the state of Ohio passed for the first time a state income tax. It, it pulled the state out of abysmal, abysmal financial stress. 
And those folks who provided leadership to getting that passed were also the people who, over the next eight years, spent every dime of it. So when I became department chair, interim department, actually, in 1989, my very first act, it was the first week of August in 1989, as the new department chair, I got to meet with the college administration and sign three pieces of paper to send a lot of money back to them because the state was bankrupt again, and the easiest place to cut funding in a state is higher education because nobody ever notices that, I guess. Well, we noticed that. So they were tough financial times. At that point, uh, George Vornovich was governor of the state of Ohio, uh, the late uh, governor and Senator Vornovich. His, and this is the second quote, we will do more with less. We will, yeah, yes, John Moore, Keith Smith, you're laughing. It wasn't funny then. Yeah. We will do more with less. And that's what the department did. When I became department chair, there was the equivalent of 15 faculty FTE. When I left the chairmanship, seven plus years later, there were 15 faculty FTE. And you go, well, what's wrong with that? Five of those positions were new to the department because of the merger of rural sociology with the former Department of Ag Education. So in effect, we had gone from 15 faculty to 10. Uh, yes, we got to replace some, but by and large, faculty positions were all taken back by administration, and we had to really lay the case to fill those positions, but we lost a third of the faculty during that tenure. So those were the worst of times. What were the best of times? The faculty that I got to work with. The faculty that I got to work with. Because in that period of time, we really kicked up our international involvement. On average, over those seven years, about 10 faculty and graduate students received outstanding awards from the college, from the university, from national organizations. Uh, we were doing international work and bringing grants in, about a million dollars a year in external funding, and frankly, the department was living off the overhead of, of, uh, outer, uh, of external gifts, because that's the only money we had. The state didn't have any. We maintained about 200 undergrads, about 100 graduate students during all of this time. So the best of times were the men and women that I got to work with on a daily basis called the faculty in the Department of Ag Education. They were wonderful people, and they still are, and those really were good times in spite of the third quote, which Rose, there's Rosemary. I remember Rosemary cutting this out of the Dilbert uh, uh, a cartoon because I had said it many times. The reward for good work is more work to be done. And that's what we did in the department, and by golly, the faculty did it. They were great. Well, again, we have a theme going here. Um, I took over the department uh, as, as chair in 2002, uh, followed Max McCansel, I guess his picture's over here, uh, in a situation that, that LH explained that uh, the department under which some experimentation, I think, is again uh, a part of Project Reinvent, which was a Kellogg-funded uh, initiative to improve land-grant colleges and universities around the country. And again, as many of you know, uh, I guess it was under Kirby's uh, chairmanship role that um, rural sociology came into our department. Um, some of that went well, some of that didn't go so well. So that was one of the struggles that, uh, that I worked with over the years that, that I was chair. Uh, and, and so, uh, just the, the culture of the department, I think, uh, evolved over that time. And I think, again, from a struggle uh, standpoint, that was an issue that, that I and the faculty, students, I think, uh, worked through that. Uh, we did have some success stories, though. So are, are Daniel and Melanie in the room? Are they, are they over here? Uh, we have a marriage that occurred between <laughs> ag education and rural sociology. So it can work. Uh, we've seen evidence of that. So, again, that's one of our accomplishments. We count, uh, you, count you two. Um, the other uh, struggle that I would say that I had, and, and again, uh, I think Tracy is going to refute that, that the, the tide has turned. Uh, but over the course of, of my uh, seven and a half years as chair, uh, our budget never increased. 
decreased every year and sometimes twice a year. Uh, we would have mid-year cuts that we got to enjoy. So that was always a struggle to figure out, you know, where you were going to save money that you didn't have anyway. Um, so, you know, some struggles that we had to deal with, obviously, but it was, a, it was an interesting time. Uh, on the success side or the achievement side, uh, mine comes down to people. Again, I would echo what these two have said, that you enjoy the people that you get to work with. And uh, there's, there's two individuals that I was able to hire when, uh, during my years as chair, and, and so it was only two. But I think both of them are in the room tonight. So uh, Tom Stewart. Uh, Tom has really been a, a tremendous addition to our department, teaches our oral communication class to, what, 120 students each semester. And I swear he's the only person in this country that can get 5.0 uh, student evaluation scores teaching people who are scared to death of public speaking. So I, I applaud you, Tom, for, uh, for what you do every semester. And again, the students just, just love it. Uh, the other one would be Dr. Emily Bach. Is Emily here? Emily's back in the corner. So Emily, I met uh, actually over in the Czech Republic uh, when I was a faculty member from the University of Missouri before I became chair. Matter of fact, I became chair while I was over in the Czech Republic, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> but uh, when we came back, she finished her degree. She ran off to Florida got a couple of degrees down there, but when we had an opening in ag communication, was able to hire her back, and, and that was, a, again, a tremendous addition to the ag communication program, and, and again, has certainly paid dividends. So both Tom and Emily, both in ag communication, uniquely enough, but have been very valuable additions, and again, we've had some other faculty additions more recently that some other folks get to talk about, so it's been fun. And my tenure with the department, three years, just a few years ago, I, I'm kind of like LH. They only could stand me for three years and <laughs> sent me somewhere else. But if you know me, I, most of my background has been at Utah State University, where I've had several administrative appointments where I currently serve in an extremely interesting position, as they call me, whatever's on my business card this week. But one of my, if I would say, first, the, the struggles that the department might have had back during my time was I was hired by a guy named Bobby Mosier. Is, is Dr. Mosier here right now? No, he's not. And as soon as he hired me, he uh, retired. And then they brought in <laughs> Bruce McFerrin. And so what I said I did as a department chair, a responsibility I had for the faculty in the college was what I call the dean seam. The dean seam. I was between deans. I came in under one dean thinking I had him fooled and then he retires on me, and I had a new dean come in who just now is your provost and is gone, so I can say these things, and I spent a lot of time working with Bruce, convincing him of the importance and the prominence of this department, and I think I did a pretty good job seeing that we're still here tonight celebrating, and he was welcome to come see us, and he greeted me warmly, and so it was the dean seam time that I had, representing to our faculty to our college administrators and above what this department is and the, the core and the, and the love and the heart and the soul of the place. The other great accomplishment I had is I kept the lights on long enough for Dr. Tracy to join you. So <laughs> I, I told him that the other day. Um, but those challenges were uh, among the things that we had that we can talk about. They, they were great challenges. Online learning came back into this campus and into in a big way. I'd say Ohio State was a little bit behind the rest of the country, I would say, but with the powerhouse of the Ohio State University, you've delivered an excellent product in your online learning and your, in your distance type educational program. That's great, and I was a small part of that with some of you out there, I say that. So, and uh, I can't say enough about the stability of the faculty. That was important for me. I had a mature faculty that I came in to mentor and work with, and I know they've only got more mature out there. Some of them look a little mature like me now, and that's a great thing to have is the stability of a mature and energetic faculty. Yes. I, I might be able to do one more than the dean scene. The dean that hired me was different than the dean that I worked with, which is different than the dean I have now. Yes. So I don't know what you call that, but... Uh, Kathy and I don't think you and I are going anywhere anytime soon, hopefully, so I appreciate that. So we're going to start back with Gary, and we're going to go back this direction. The, the, the second question that I have is, is for you to move beyond the department. Talk about the college and the university. How would you characterize the college and the university during your time as chair? That's, that's easy for me to say. I'm most recent, and many of you have experienced this if you're under the age of 30, and that's the academic powerhouse of The Ohio State University, and therefore, the increased entry requirements. We heard it from ag teachers and county agents 
when I was a department chair. Our kids can't get into your Ohio State because you've raised standards. And we would say, yes, we welcome those standards. And we have a way around those standards with ATI, with the branch campuses, but the Ohio State University. That was one of the changes if, in the tenor of when I, they admitted me to the PhD program in 1985 and made some mistakes along the way, Dr. Barrick, and let me out in 87. But I think the academic standards of the Ohio State University show to this day. And that's one of the ways I save reputation. Yeah, I'd say for me, and again, I came in uh, to this university without having any prior knowledge. As a matter of fact, I had never been on this campus before I came to interview. Uh, and so that was a very unique experience, just the size and scope of the university being one thing. But the thing that struck me, well, there really two things. Uh, but one thing that really struck me is how much pride uh, the students, and I think the faculty too, but really the students and the graduates, the alumni, take in this institution and in the university itself. So, you know, singing Carmen, Ohio, which we might enjoy later tonight, uh, and just being able to say OHIO and, and take all the pictures and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, I spent some time at Iowa State University, spent some time at the University of Missouri. They were proud of those institutions, but you just got a, a, a ratcheted much higher level of pride and, and invigoration, I guess, into this university. So I think that's one thing that I, I really noticed. Um, and then I'd have to mention football. Um, <laughs> I spent 17 years at the University of Missouri when they were just not very good. Um, <laughs> I think we might have went to two bowl games in that time. I got here on January 1st of 2001. We went through a season with uh, what Jim Tressel and Craig Krenzel as the quarterback, uh, which was kind of a miracle season. But in January of, of 2003, then it was, so we defeated the University of Miami in the Fiesta Bowl in Tempe, Arizona. And I was able to go to that game with my wife and to sit in the stands and just feel the enthusiasm of, of literally the whole university around that experience was something I'll never forget. And again, I think it just really kind of epitomizes what Ohio State means to so many people. And Florida still hates Urban Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> I get so tired of that. I, I need to tell a quick story about Dr. Warmbrook. Uh, Dr. Warmbro was interim vice president and dean when I was uh, asked to his office and he offered me the opportunity to become interim department chair. This was July 1, 2, 3, along in there, whatever it was, 1989. And so we talked about yada, yada, yada. Yeah, we're, we're going to do this. But, but Dr. Warmbro, there's, there's something that you probably need to know, and that is that Susan and I have planned for many years to take our children to Europe, and we are going to be gone for three weeks in July. And Dr. Warmbrod said it's the only time that he has ever said this because it's the only time he needed to. I hadn't planned on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we all know that Dr. Warmbrod planned on everything and cross T's and dotted I's, but I threw him for a loop that day. So we just decided, ah, I, I, LH can still do both the interim associate dean and department chair for a month, and I started August 1. <laughs> um, and the concept really is the administration of, of the whole agricultural enterprise, and, and not only in the university, but also in the, in the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, when, when you have, uh, you know, associate deans who are tenured in your own department, L.H. Newcomb, Keith Smith. Keith and I started on the very same day at Ohio State, July 1 of 1980. Uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Moser was, you know, you know, he was a pig science guy, but he really got the, the, the teaching and learning and the people side of, of what we were doing. And that just makes life a lot easier when you have folks to work with who have an appreciation and an understanding for what the heck that you're trying to do in a department like, at that point, ag education. A quick word about the university. Uh, when I was chair, Ed Jennings was president. He was an outstanding president in my view. Uh, at that time, his provost was W. Ann Reynolds, and the push was clearly on for more research productivity among faculty, a greater emphasis on scholarship. Uh, they were determined, and they were leading that, and they were pushing that, and you could not miss, you could not miss the signals. Um, also, University and college-wide, Dave Benfield, W. Ann Reynolds was the point person 
for um, leading the university's decision to make OARDC a part of Ohio State University. Until that time, the experiment station, OARDC, had been an independent unit with its own governing board. Same board as Ohio State had. The only thing was President Jennings had to get up and leave the chair, and Roy Cotman sat in it to, to do the, um, the work of the board of ORDC. Well, for reasons we need not rehash here, that deal was consummated, and that was a very big change for this college. Also, at the college level, we'd had all the stability of Roy Cotman. He would have been the one that had appointed Bob Warmbrode. He'd been there for 22, 3, 4 years. I forgot just how many. Uh, Roy left. Francille Fireball was interim. You see patterns emerging always, don't you? Then Max Lennon came in. Max stayed three years maybe, went to Clemson to be president of Clemson. Another interim. Then Fred Hutchinson followed him. Um, that's stressful. That is stressful on a college, and it's stressful on a department. Uh, we came through it all fine. Um, at one time, I read those poems you shared that Susie sent to me from Max McGee. I don't know if you saw those. Those that don't know, you just missed something. But Max was a graduate of the department. He always wrote poetry, and he referred to all of us as being interim because it was a place in flux during that time. If I remember correctly, Tracy, the question was, what was going on at the university and the college, and the level. college during the time we were chair? Yep. During the time I was chair is when basically the university under Ed Jennings' leadership went from an open admission university to uh, selective admissions. So that was uh, noted with some apprehension in a lot of places, including the student body and the students we would get. So that would be one of the, I, as has been indicated here, one of the major changes in the university. I would say another major change, uh, um, which happened basically after I was chair, was when Gordon Gee arrived and had this deal about uh, uh, we need to reorganize the university and we need to rearrange things and we probably need to get rid of some programs and make for others. And so the College of Agriculture under Bobby Moser's leadership immediately got on the reorganization uh, uh, bent, uh, and a result of that was what has been referred to here uh, by several of my fellow former chairs, the merging into the Department of Agricultural Education, the rural sociology faculty who were in the Department of Agricultural Economics. And I think you've heard enough comments as to that did make a difference. So I'm going to I'm going to ask this question, open it up to, to anybody at this point. As you as you look at the 100 year history of the department, what do you think were the most influential incidences, either internal in the department or external that shaped the trajectory of the department? Well, I would make one comment. I think one of the uh, strong points of the department, uh, one of the uh, uh, characteristics of the department has been, uh, quite frankly, its size in terms of faculty, uh, and particularly size as it relates to graduate, facu graduate students, particularly PhDs. Uh, the, the having come to Ohio State from another university, the reputation of Ohio State was that it's big, it's large, the ag ed faculty is large, larger than most faculties in the country, and particularly the PhD program. 
and one of the major influences of this department has since we had such a strong and such a large graduate program the graduates of this department particularly the PhDs who would go to did go to other states other state universities and other cooperative extension programs in other states as directors or associate directors as department chairs and as and for faculty members uh, i think that's uh, one of the major points that i would make and and i would say dr warmbrod we we started counting up the number of current administrators who have been a part of this department i think we were well into the 20s who were either a department chair or associate dean or whatever your title is today gary and so um uh and so we have people we've we have probably over t uh, clearly over 20 alumni of this department today that are serving in those kinds of roles i'd say a mega influence if i remember the question uh, has to be, historically at least, the, um, the role of federal funding and federal legislation. That's why we are a department. That's why there was year one. And I'd say also state, uh, state budgets, state department of education budgets. Um, if you look at the, it, just in, in more in my, my era, the uh, Vocational Education Acts of 63 and 68 and what came along with that. If you look at uh, I forgot which act it was. Maybe Bob or Kirby would, could tell me, but we had this VE, uh, um, the EPD. EPD. Yeah, the, the, there were states that could uh, provide funding for a student to get a doctoral degree, and, and that really boosted graduate enrollment here. The, the, the National Center for Research and Vocational Education, that really boosted graduate enrollment and, and had many other contingent benefits. Those faculty... Uh, who, those people in the, in the National Center who had ag ed backgrounds served on graduate committees, sometimes they taught courses or participated in seminars. So uh, the State Department funding is a ghost. It's all gone, John. Everything has changed. The federal funding, the federal legislation it is not what it was, and it's made a difference. And ag ed-like uh, programs, ACEL and, and the other morphing that's taken place, and I mean that in a, in a positive sense, have been a result of adjusting to that change and to that new reality around the country. And I'm very pleased, Tracy, to see this department uh, leading the way in, in many respects there. I, I, I would add to uh, Dr. Wormbrod's comments also the uh, leadership of the teachers of agriculture in this state in the state and national organizations of ag teachers. And for those who, uh, you know, I've got a couple of them sitting right here in front of me who go on to leadership positions in the Ohio Department of Education as school superintendents uh, at Springboro now, Margareta before that, Green Career Center before that. I mean, that kind of leadership in the public education environment in the state and also with our state and national organizations then the, then the other part, and this is a, a bit adrift of, I think, where, where you were asking, but I, I, have, um, I have continued to participate in the, in the Ag Ed, Teacher Ed Professional Organization, AAAE, uh, and, and listening to research papers. And um, we've already said some things about the research series. But when we see the students of this department, Bob, who were in 85, 86, 87, 88, 995, or at least some portion of that, and I see their presentations, and I see the presentations of their students at wherever they are now at a university, and now because I'm so dang old, the presentations of their students' students, because it is always impeccably done research, and they understand what research methodology and design is, they understand data analysis, they understand quantitative methodology, and I know where it all came from. And it came from those kinds of courses that Bob and Clarence started a couple years back. So I should have went ahead of you because that's what I was gonna say. Uh, um, but in addition to that, and again, coming from the outside and not having the benefit of those 
uh, it made a tremendous difference in the quality of research across the whole profession. I think when the pre-sessions, and I can't remember, was AATEA then or AAAE, whatever the acronym was, but several years in a row, uh, faculty from Ohio State University would run a pre-session at our professional conference, and they would be attended by, what, 40, 50, 60 uh, faculty, graduate students, but it was, it was basically trying to teach in a very condensed format what they taught in, in those research series courses. So I think that has had a tremendous impact, not only on the program directly, but, but even more broadly on the whole profession. And then again, you take into the consideration that the graduates of this institution, when they go out to faculty positions, have um, reflected those same courses or developed similar courses. Uh, it, the ripple effect just, just uh, takes over in many ways. There's one other thing that I think really made a difference, and, and LH was involved with this, but it was the uh, distance delivery of the college teaching improvement series uh, that for, was it one year or two years? I can't remember how many years it was done, but there was, I don't know. I, I know University of Missouri had a site that, that the program was downloaded to, and the whole focus was on teaching improvement. And again, that was something that was uh, unique in that it, it utilized distance delivery, first of all, but it also really emphasized uh, and placed a high value on improving college teaching, not just in, in our area of agricultural education, but in other areas of colleges of agriculture. And, and I think it sent a strong message about how this institution, especially this department, valued good teaching. My, my final question for the night is, as you think about the alumni that you've had the opportunity to work with in this department, um, who, who were some of those alumni who you feel shaped the field in ag education, extension education, the industry, um, university? Who, who were some of those alums? What, what have they done to be real change agents for our field, for our profession, for our industry? I was told to begin, so I shall. Well, we could be here all night. And uh, I did something I don't usually do, and Tom Stewart's enjoying it. If he was paying attention, he would have heard what I said. I left my notes at home, so I apologize to those whose name I should call. But uh, there have been so many, so many. Ralph Bender stayed here his whole career. But look at the domino effect. Bob Taylor got his Ph.D. here, and look what Bob accomplished with the National Center. Uh, Bob McCormick uh, in Extension, Clarence Cunningham, Keith Smith, Chuck Leifer in 4-H. There's no one that's been more distinguished as a 4-H guru than Chuck Leifer. And, and that list could go, could go on forever. Jerry Halterman sat right up there in 208 with Norm Stanley by his side and designed what now is the empire that you just get to walk in and inherit. ATI was nothing but a, a cry from the commodity groups in the state that we need technically trained individuals, and Jerry and Norm Stanley and others put that together. Look at what Harlan Ridenauer did in curriculum material service and, and Roger Rediger. Uh, the, the list goes on if you start naming department chairs and deans and associate deans and Jim McComas as a president. Bob. <laughs> Well, the, uh, his response, my, our response to, to uh, Tracy's question, if we start talking about people, we're going to forget some people, some very important people. And um, earlier this week, I took a look at uh, a uh, publication that Mac and I did, which is a a list of, uh, of the Ph.D. graduates from the first two graduates in 1938 through the year 2000. And that was a total of 405 Ph.D. degrees being uh, offered or being earned. They weren't offered, they were earned. Uh, and uh, I began to go through the list, and I ran out of time of how many of those persons have been university presidents. The first Ph.D. 
earned at Ohio State was a person by the name of O.C. Adderhold from University of Georgia, who was about a 20-year president of the University of Georgia. And there have been other graduates who are university presidents. And uh, so uh, uh, to name them all, obviously I would forget some, and so I will not even attempt. But, but including international students who are either now or have been presidents of colleges in their universities. So I think a very good uh, activity for a graduate student who needs a project for some special occasion, take a look at our graduates uh, who have been uh, in higher education at other universities for a, 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 in any position, and I think you'll find a, a large number, and I think you'll find a large uh, uh, variety of positions. It occurs to me that another hallmark, I, I think, and Bob, if I've got this wrong, you'll surely help me here. Uh, I think this department has um, perhaps some singular distinction for its reputation of reaching out, uh, cultivating, and uh, mentoring and graduating minority doctoral students. You know, we heard uh, Eddie Moore today, I think, mention Marvin Field at Virginia State College. Marvin was a graduate here, and, and Bob would know better, and it was long before Bob got here too, I think, that this place and this College of Education did the same thing, was a pioneer in, in providing the kind of environment and the kind of commitment uh, that it took to make breakthroughs there. Ditto, ditto, and amen. I, I would, I, I agree with all that you've said, but I, I think there's um, some individuals that didn't get mentioned, and partly because of where they're sitting, I think. Um, honestly, as, as I look across the, the history that I've been involved in ag education since, you know, the mid-80s, I guess, um, I, I've known a lot of the, the people that were leaders in, in agricultural education nationally, and uh, quite honestly, the, the three gentlemen to my right, your left, uh, would rank extremely high I, I don't know, top five, I don't know what you want to say. But no offense to you guys over here. <laughs> but, I mean, you talk about giants. I mean, I, I was in awe of, of sitting in this room <laughs> because of, of who came before me. So I would have to really take my hat off to the three people sitting here that have had a, a huge impact not only on agricultural education, but uh, education in and about agriculture uh, in many ways with the, the Green Book that Dr. Wormbrode was instrumental in, in helping, uh, helping authors. So um, I just take my hat off to you three. And the la last thing I would add is the people that I cannot mention but have been high school teachers for 30 or 40 years or county agents for 30 or 40 years who have taken their bachelor's degree or perhaps her master's degree, and worked in the every day of agriculture extension education. I think that's so important that we, we have great giants up here and we honor and respect, and I don't belong up here at all, but I want to call out or shout out to those that are the teachers that we have turned out and the agents we have turned out and the agricultural leaders in industry that go unnamed but show up to work every day as a Buckeye, as a graduate of this department, and I think that's important for us to mention too for our 100 years. We, we could go f a, a long time tonight and really garner a great deal of, of, of history. But, um, you know, from my perspective, I would probably echo Dr. Birkenholtz in, in saying that when I sat in the, the chair's office the first day, um, there were real weights on my shoulders and I felt them because of the folks that come before me and uh, I, I think one of the legacies of this department has been the leadership of this department and so we are we are really blessed to have had such wonderful leadership in 
in the folks that are here, those who served in interim roles during that time, during important transitions. And so um, I really appreciate what you've done to make sure that, that we're having a great celebration tonight because of you all, your leadership, and then, of course, the, the faculty, staff, and students that you had the opportunity to lead. Please join me in thanking our department chairs for joining us this evening. Thank you to all of our six department chairs. I think it was a great opportunity for all of us to hear from six of our nine department chairs. So thank you um, to all of you for that. Um, but now it is time for a little audience participation from all of you. We will have a question for all of you to discuss at your tables. After we give you a few minutes, we will ask for some of you to share your thoughts. All right, so here's your question. Who is or was your most influential and most memorable or favorite ACL faculty or staff member? Or for those who were not a student, who is, was your favorite or most memorable ACL faculty or staff member and which whom you interact with? So I have three minutes. Discuss with your tables and we'll get a few responses after three minutes. Okay, so uh, probably my most influential um, faculty member uh, was sitting next to me, and, and what a great honor that was, Jan Henderson. Um, Jan exposed me to my first feminist literature. Um, Jan showed me that, yeah, whoop, whoop, that's what I'm talking about, girl. Um, <laughs> she helped me understand you can teach a little differently than some of the other folks in the department and be very effective. Uh, she helped me understand that as a female, I had a place, and I really appreciated that because it, it wasn't it wasn't a lot of us. And so, uh, to see a female faculty member who was so very welcoming, uh, not only to women um, but also international students, and I just I can't tell you how much of a difference that made. And and Emma Lou too, who's not here tonight, uh, but but thank you, Jan. Well, I can say with uh, no hesitation, I would not have a PhD if it was not for that woman right there. She really helped me so much. Um, even one night when my computer died, I don't know, should I tell this or not? <laughs> Maybe not. I kind of needed to finish this up. It was kind of important timing here, and my computer at home died. I called her, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? She met me. We kind of broke into the Ag Admin building, went and got the computer. I took it home. I finished up everything. Yes, I'll admit it. That's what we did. We broke the law, but thank you so much. <laughs> you could count on this woman. I've stayed in contact with her ever since. Um, I just can't say enough about her. And you have your Yes. Um, again, uh, not that we wanted, wanted to embarrass or put uh, Jen on the spot. Uh, but it was, it was a fact. Uh, during my time in the, school, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the department, we have, I believe, more international students than us, maybe compared now, compared to now. At that time, it was almost a common saying within us, the international students, that if you have not taken Jen's class, you were in trouble. <laughs> because his class will, among other things, boost you, encourage you, give you more focus as you pursue your courses in education. So Jen was instrumental in nurturing. She wasn't the only one, but at least uh, at that time, she was one of those that I could nurture them. Awesome. Thank you. Do we have someone from over on this side that would like to share? Yes, we do. I missed the table discussion because I was in the conference room down the way that said men's with Dr. Barrick. But uh, in the 80s, we had the great fortune, and I can't 
just name one, but we had the great fortune in the 1980s, if we wanted to be teachers, we had to run a gauntlet of greatness that went through Knight, Newcomb, and, and uh, Hedges. Well, we had uh, both older alums and younger alums here, and the two younger alums I thought were both undergraduates. Turns out they're both teachers, but anyway, I'll, I'll give you the names mentioned. Two deceased, one Harlan Ridenauer, one Mac McCaslin, and then two who are still with us, fortunately, Bob Warmbrode, and he was mentioned for making statistics and research alive and interesting and understandable. L.H. Newcomb, because he was real, he was authentic, he was passionate, and a butt kicker. <laughs> <laughs> It was a little difficult having actual two faculty members at the table, so we had to dismiss them slightly. <laughs> but um, I talked a little bit about, for me personally, was Dr. Bobby Moser, and um, that was my buddy just because my maiden name is actually Moser, and so I would call him Uncle Bobby, and he obliged, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and, but outside of that, um, Dr. Newcomb, just because he would always crash the manners, dinners, at Dean Mosier's house, and that was always a lot of fun, and you were always the life of the party. But then also, um, Dr. Kano, and just being able to work with each individual student, while it wasn't my favorite class, uh, he was always a great teacher, and that was something that our and other students said as well. All right, thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause there. Now imagine, if you will, a group of students and alumni who are sitting around a fire talking about their time at Ohio State. What would they say to each other? What stories would they share? What advice would alumni give to students, and how would students talk about how things have changed? This evening, we have four students and four alumni who will be sitting around that figurative fire and will have the opportunity to eavesdrop on that conversation. Blake and I will introduce our panel, so please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Karen Argabright is a doctoral candidate and graduate associate in the department with a concentration in community leadership and extension education. Her focus on culture and change has been practically applied through projects such as a multi-state extension organizational culture assessment, a redesign of OSU Extension's new employee onboarding process, facilitation of OSU Extension's County Director Assessment Center, and envisioning OSU Extension's future through strategic foresight. Karen came to her doctoral work with nine years of management experience in the farming and ranching industry. She holds a bachelor's in animal science and a master's in ag extension education, both from Ohio State. John H. Davis graduated from The Ohio State University with a bachelor's and master's in agriculture education in 1967 and 1967, respectively. He taught agriculture for five years in Ashtabula County before being asked to join the state staff of agriculture education. He moved back home and supervised ag teachers in the Northeast Ohio and was director of FFA Camp Muskingum for 20 years. In 1987, Mr. Davis was selected to be the state director of agriculture education. He took an early retirement in 1992, but continued to direct the FFA camp until 1995 for 28 years total. Mr. Davis is enjoying retirement and volunteering with special commitment to the national program called Project Food, Land and People, and Agriculture and Environmental Literacy Program. He is married to Ruth with two grown children, Todd, who followed his father's footsteps as FFA camp director, and Justine. While as a student, he was an OSU Varsity O football manager under Coach Woody Hayes. He has also received many awards and accolades for his professional and volunteer work. Dr. Jackie Deeds is a pre professor emerita from Mississippi State University. Dr. Deeds holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Ed from Oregon State University and a PhD from what she describes as OSU East. She is the first woman agriculture teacher from Oregon and was president of the Oregon Agricultural Teachers Association. She joined the faculty at Mississippi State University in 1985 and retired in 2012. 
During her time at MSU, she served on numerous committees and provided leadership to the American Association for Agricultural Education, or as we previously heard earlier, AAAE, as president. Some of her honors included Southern Region AAAE Outstanding Agricultural Educator, MSU Outstanding Faculty Woman 2007, and the Mississippi Business and Professional Woman State Woman of Achievement. Her retirement activities include serving as an advisor to Alpha Gamma Delta Sorority at Oregon State and being active in Beta Sigma Phi and PEO. She serves on the Oregon FFA Foundation Board of Directors and volunteers for various community and church activities. Aunt Jackie attends many, the many and varied activities of five great nephews and other loved ones' children. Pat Petzl has worked in the area of agriculture communication and public relations since 1992 after receiving a degree in agricultural communication from the Ohio State University. During college, Pat worked for the American Quarter Horse Association in Amarillo, Texas, where she was a writer for the Quarter Horse Journal. In 2000, Pat completed a master's degree from o Ohio University's E.W. Scripps School of Journalism. In her early role at Ohio Farm Bureau, Pat directed the organization's efforts to increase awareness and the understanding of Ohio agriculture. In 2009, Pat was named the Vice President of Communications for Ohio Farm Bureau, where she leads the organization's communications efforts. Pat resides in Grove City, but recently took a farming plunge by purchasing a small farm in Ross County next to her family's farm. Abby Motter is a junior honors student majoring in agri-science education from Mansfield, Ohio. She's involved with Ohio Staters Incorporated, Agricultural Education Society, the CFAES Ambassador Team, and the Edward S. Beanie Drake Board of Directors. She is serving as a national FFA facilitator and is conducting undergraduate research. After graduation, Abby hopes to work as an agricultural educator before furthering her education with the goal of eventually instructing at the university level and working with international agricultural education programs. Dan Traer is the current superintendent of Spring Bureau Schools. He has served as superintendent for Margareta Local Schools and for Greene County Career Center. In addition to other administrative roles, he was an agriculture teacher at London City Schools. Dan's agriculture education de degrees include a bachelor's de degree in 1993 and a master's degree in 1999. As an undergraduate student, Dan was involved in Ag Ed Society, Alpha Zeta Fraternity, Sphinx Senior Honorary, and Ohio Staters Incorporated. Dan is actively involved in his community and has been honored to receive awards such as the Ohio ACTE Administrator of the Year Award and Ohio, State, Ohio State's Meritorious Service to Students Award. Dan is married to Kim and where they have four children and three grandchildren. Katarina Sharp is a fourth year agricultural communication student from Stoutsville, Ohio in Fairfield County. She is double minoring in animal sciences and professional writing. She has been on two study abroad trips and has been a member of the Agricultural Communicators of Tomorrow Club for four years, where she currently serves as the public relations chair. Kat is the third generation of the Sharp family to attend Ohio State and be a student of this department. After college, she hopes to find a job in the agricultural industry that will allow her to write, design, and share information about agriculture with the public. Mariah Stoller is a senior from Marietta, Ohio, studying community leadership with a specialization in community and extension education. She currently serves as the president of Alpha Sigma Upsilon Sorority and as a peer mentor for freshmen in the college. She has also conducted undergraduate research with the department through projects on the vice president's conversation of the future of extension and CFAS peer mentoring program. In addition to these involvements, Mariah works for the OSU Extension State Community Development Office and volunteers with the St. Thomas More Newman Center. After graduation, Mariah plans to pursue a master's in community and extension education and eventually work in extension administration. Please help me in welcoming our students and alumni for our panel. Well, as we sit around the campfire here at FFA camp, now, it is an honor to be able to sit with this distinguished group of students and alumni. And over the next four hours, we're going to discuss a lot of memories. 
But first, we will start with a question, and if we bring that microphone down here to Pat, I'll hand my microphone off to Mr. Davis, and we'll go down the line. But the first question, we will ask everyone to answer briefly. And then from there, we have a, a little jar here that we're going to draw questions out. So if an alumni draws a question, it'll be for the students. And then when the students draw a question, it'll be for the alumni. And some questions may be answered by everyone. Some may be answered by one or two. It depends upon how the spirit moves this group up here. So our first question that will start with Mr. Davis, why did you choose Ohio State and this department? Well, it all started with uh, a VOAG teacher, Welch Barnett. I don't know if there's anybody in here that knew Welch Barnett, but he was my freshman ag teacher. And uh, I had a lot of respect for him. He had high expectations, and he inspected to make sure I did it, and I respect that person. And when I became a state supervisor, I tried to get that philosophy across to teachers. Expect it, and then inspect for it. That's where a lot of people don't do they don't do the inspection part, and uh, that's really helped. But my granddad, I worked for him when I was in high school, and he wanted me to be an engineer. So I, he passed away, and I came down here first quarter to be an engineer. Well, when I was down for orientation, I uh, was at the Ohio Union, and here a guy run through the Ohio Union, and here I showed sheep at, with him at uh, our county fair. But he was in a school district that was in another county. And uh, that's the only time I saw the guy I was at the county fair. I showed sheep against him. So I was at the right place at the right time because I asked him, I said, what are you doing down here at this time? He says, well, I'm the head football, uh, head football manager with Woody. And uh, I said, well, boy, that, that's something. I didn't know you did that. <laughs> and he says, yeah, and I need some help. You want to help? And I said, where do I have to be? <laughs> So 2.30 the next day, I was on the field. Uh, and that was it, being at the right place at the right time. And uh, so after that, I hadn't taken physics in high school because I had two classes of OA. So I had to take physics down here. Well, with physics and not really being that much interested, I decided in football, I want to go somewhere that they like me. And I decided to go to agriculture. I come over to Ag Education second quarter, and that's how I got here. Well, my story, I think, is probably similar to many of you, where it doesn't feel like I s chose Ohio State. Sometimes I feel like it was chosen for me, because when you come from a family, uh, and that's the tradition, um, it, it's really not a choice of if you're going to college. Of course you're going to college, so it's expectations, like John said. But then uh, when you're in the orbit of Ohio State, it's, uh, it's assumed that that's, of course, you're going to Ohio State. So. Uh, I didn't disagree with that, so it was a great choice. And, and uh, the, the question is, you know, how did you find a major? Because, you know, I, I, it's always that, that first year is where do you fit and what, what do you want to do with your time at Ohio State? And again, just as John said, right place, right conversation at the right time. It was uh, a, a meeting with uh, Kurt Paulson, who was, uh, would become my advisor, but it was just a, one, of those, one of those meetings where you know you're matching um, uh, you, you feel like you fit, and you feel like, wow, this is this is an area where I can combine what I enjoy doing, and somebody's saying, hey, you're pretty good at this, and they recognize some talent, and it just gives you that little nudge, that little bit of confidence that you need to take the next step, and I'll forever be grateful for that. Well, first of all, I want to object because this was not on the list of questions <laughs> that I received, uh, <laughs> which is sort of like life, isn't it? Um, you know, we say it all started with an ag teacher, and that was the case for me. I um, started taking high school agriculture back when girls weren't allowed. And um, my they had started the ag program at my high school, and the ag teacher, being very astute, as I learned later in classes, came and asked my dad, who was on the school board and had a logging company, if he would be on his advisory committee. And then he looked at me and said, you should take ag. And considering I was at a three-room elementary school and went to a high school where as a freshman you could take ag, home ec, band, or chorus as a freshman, ag seemed to be the right option uh, for me. 
And um, then I went to Oregon State, and by that time, that ag teacher was at Oregon State working on his PhD. And he said, Jackie, go talk to those people in ag education. I said, yes, sir. And I did, and became the first female ag teacher in the state of Oregon. Years later, when I was president of the Oregon Ag Teachers, I ran into this same guy at AVA, as it was called then, and he was at the National Center for Research and Vocational Education at Ohio State. And some of you old folks will remember Dan Dunham. And Dan said, it's time for you to get your PhD. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, come to Ohio State. Sue and I and the kids will be there. You'll have a built-in family. And by that time, by the time I got here, he had moved back to Oregon. But um, <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a, a connection there. But what I, what I do know, what kept me here was family. Not that I had family here, but the fact that people became family. Um, when I moved here, I had a truck that I had driven across country with all my worldly possessions, and I was given a phone number, and it says, when you find an apartment and you're ready to move, call this number. And I did, and it was uh, George Wardlow, and I think he and Stacy Garten maybe went, and Stacy's here, got my rental truck and drove it to my apartment, and when I got there, there must have been 15 graduate students there who said, is this the place? Let's unpack. And by then I knew that I, I could be happy here because there were people who cared already and they didn't even know me. And uh, the faculty continued that tradition and became not only uh, family and colleagues, but mentors throughout my career. Um, I think how I got to Ohio State's a little different than probably most everybody is um, I didn't come from a high school with an ag program So I didn't have the influence of an ag teacher growing up. I had the influence of the family farm um, So I came to Ohio State to me There was no other option mainly because my family said I couldn't do it So I went to do it and it turns out ultimately um, they were right because my my career in at Ohio State has been somewhat transversed here. I started out almost 20 years ago in animal science and then finished that up early 2000s after I came back from a stint in Texas. But then as I was going through that, Ohio State was the only option ever for me because I just knew I loved it. And by then I was a different person and it made more sense for me to continue on. So the animal science got finished. But how I came to this department was pretty interesting. Um, I had the early ambitions of becoming an extension educator. And with that, you needed a master's degree. So the last quarter of my animal science undergrad, I took a, a class in the department. And it was probably the best class I had in all of my undergrad years. No offense to animal science people. But I, I really enjoyed it, and it's kind of sent me on the path that I am right now. So when you're younger, and I remember I was really young, and somebody asked me, um, what did I want to do when I grew up? And normally when you're that young, people say, like, I want to be a princess or an Olympian or a police officer. And I was like, I want to be a dairy farmer. And, well, that did kind of change a little bit over the years. But I always knew that I wanted to work in agriculture, but I didn't really know where I wanted to go with that. And when I was about a junior in high school, I was talking to my dad about it, and he goes, well, have you thought about ag comp? And I was like, no, what's that? And so he's talking to me about it, and he goes, well, you know, you like to write and design things and take pictures and talk to people. And he's like, well, that's kind of what AdCom does. And I was like, okay. So I looked into it a little bit more, and I was like, wow, this sounds like a good fit for me. And then I started looking into Ohio State because that's where all my family's come, and I really wanted to come here anyways. And I was like, oh, wow. So not only is this the place for me, but this is, um, I think Ohio State has one of the very best AdCom programs in the country. So I was like, well, that's kind of a perfect fit. So that's how I ended up here. Well, like Kat, I actually initially had an interest in agricultural communication because of my uncle, Eric Barrett, who has also been a mentor to me throughout the years. But he encouraged me to check out the program. And what really made me decide to come to Ohio State was actually the staff that I met with on my prospective student visit. Emily Wickham, right in front of me. It just brings back so many memories. and. On that visit, I knew I wanted to come to Ohio State. 
And in meeting and talking with her, I found out about the extension program. And I was like, there's a program for me to be an extension agent. I was so excited and I haven't changed my mind. So many people have given me so many opportunities to research and work in the field and just get more experiences than classes. And it's just been a perfect fit. So my family encouraged me. And that first time I stepped foot on campus, I just knew. As almost every pre-service agriculture educator can tell you, the positive influence from your own ag teacher in high school is one of the biggest factors that encourages you to go after this major. And the story is no different for me. Um, throughout high school, um, Mr. Joel Albright, an OSU alum, um, was very almost forceful in encouraging me to come to Ohio State. <laughs> um, so my sophomore year of high school, I decided that I was gonna visit Wilmington first, um, just because I could. Um, and while I was there on a visit, I was like, oh, college sounds cool, all right. Um, it wasn't until I came on and experienced Ohio State for a day visit that I really felt as if I was being personally um, invested in by the people here at Ohio State and specifically the people within our department. I remember seeing familiar faces walking up to our department and having them remember me and know my name. And that was just super exciting because they had taken the time to learn about me from my experiences in 4-H and FFA and wanted to continue to invest in my success um, throughout my college and um, into my future career. One thing I'd like to share, uh, I was poor whenever I was in high school, but I didn't really know it. But I do now because my dad never made more than $2,000 a year, and there were six in the family, six uh, siblings, and I was the oldest. And it was, hadn't it been for VOAG, I would have never got more than 30 miles away from home because that's the only place I knew was 30 miles around. And it was because of FFA get, getting me to the convention and the contests that we had here in Columbus and then a couple times to Kansas City. And uh, that really helped a great deal. Now, you might ask, I didn't have any money, so how did I pay for this, uni or for this university? Back then, they had the stadium scholarship dorm. They had dormitories under the stadium. And they remodeled those because they were like army barracks back then. <clears throat> but guess what? I was in the b section they hadn't got remodeled yet. <laughs> so there's 16 of us in 16 bunk beds in there for the first quarter. We slept on the first bunk, and we put all our possessions on the second bunk. And it was a great experience. And it wasn't just ag. <laughs> it was all kinds of uh, people coming to Ohio State University. And guess what the tuition was? $90 a quarter. I don't know how many books you can buy for $90 <laughs> nowadays. All right, we're going to pull out some questions. We're going to start with Mr. Davis pulling a yellow question, which means students... This will be for you. Your question is, it all four don't have to answer. But here's a fun, quick question. Okay, maybe you do. What's your favorite Ohio State tradition? Since you've got the mic. All right. Well, besides Carmen, Ohio, which is everyone's favorite tradition, or at least I hope so, something that's kind of unique to CFAS is Ag Olympics. And I would consider this my favorite college tradition because we are the only college where we have the opportunity for all of our student organizations and all of our students to be together in one space and to share one space um, in some friendly competition, mainly with tug of war, um, but having the chance to interact with everyone in our college and um, enjoy the end of spring semester would make it my favorite tradition. This may be kind of a cliche response, but Buckeye football, definitely. <laughs> and the only reason I say this is because the qualities that you see in the fans and what they try to adhere to, excellence, being respectful, being so passionate, that rings true throughout the whole university and especially throughout this department. I have never met a group of people more passionate in my life, and I think that's a tradition that from hearing the other leaders of the department talk and hearing everyone talk here, that passion's run through through the years. So Script Ohio and um, Carmen Ohio, I, those have always been like my favorite things. I love the music and I love watching the band do Script Ohio. I think it's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. And um, when we do Carmen Ohio, so this past year we, at our um, end of the year banquet last year, 
everybody stood in a big circle in the room and we sang Carmen Ohio together and I thought that was really, really cool. And of course we sing Carmen Ohio at like every event, but I thought that was particularly special. I also love Carmen Ohio. It's kind of moving sometimes, all the time. Um, <laughs> but another tradition, I don't know if it's a tradition yet, but I'm sure it will be if it's not, is the amazingness of the band and what they can do on the field. I mean, I just, I'll pick up the YouTube videos and watch them since I don't go to the games, but it's just every time they're trying to one-up themselves all the time. So. Well, Jackie, since you have the microphone, we're going to have you draw a pink one, and that will be a question for the alumni. And you can go ahead and read it. Oh, you can, oh, she fine. gets to pick. <laughs> okay, for alumni, what were some of the biggest life lessons you learned through your time in this department? What, be it classes, organizations, from faculty, whatever. Again, no surprise, you all know this, but it, it's, the, it's the network, it's the, the friends you make and the, and the colleagues that'll uh, become, uh, stay colleagues forever. Um, I remember, and, and Kath, this is where you have to take the code of silence, because uh, I remember this skinny sophomore who had a flock of seal, seagulls haircut that we all kind of like, who is this guy? And it was Adam Sharp, it was Kath's uncle, and he's now... <laughs> My boss and Leah's boss, he's executive vice president of Ohio Farm Bureau, and um, I've worked with Adam now for a number of years, and sometimes, Dan, I feel like you, you probably can relate to this. You look around and like, when, when did the kids get in charge? Like, when, how did that happen? But, but I love that idea. I'm, I'm proud of Abbott, Adam and, and what he's accomplished. Um, um, Leah's an ag com major. She's one of the uh, preeminent ag law experts in the state and has gone used her ag com a degree, you know, really well in that capacity, but but it's those relationships that you you make as a as a sophomore that uh, 25 years later you may be working for that person or with that person, but those those relationships and that network is just so valuable. When I became uh, director of ag education downtown, we always had monthly meetings with the OSU staff, and when we was in the 70s, we had the big explosion of vocational education and agriculture being a part of that uh, and we had a great task and that is to ha come up with ag teachers when I supervised Northeast Ohio we went from 39 ag teachers up there to 110 so we really needed ag teachers and I was glad to see that we talked about the ag teachers there and with the uh, 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 you folks that were before us <laughs> because it is very important that both downtown and uptown, we worked together and I appreciated that. Some great staff members at that period of time. Uh, well, this was, question was on the list, so I'm prepared for this one. Um, <laughs> when I came to Ohio State, it was kind of like country comes to town. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a little school. I went to Oregon State, wasn't that big. But I want to tell you, one of the, the things that affected me most over time was working with the other inter, or with the international graduate students. Uh, I felt I was coming to a different country or culture myself. But um, one of my sharpest memories is that, and I, I wish I could remember the name, and, and some of the facult, older faculty might remember, we had a, a graduate student who'd come here he finished a, a master's and a Ph.D., and he'd been in the States like five or six years and went home. Um, left his family and came here, and he'd only been home a few months and was killed in, a, in an automobile accident. And the, uh, the uh, Ag Ed graduate students were talking about what we should do. And it became very Im impressive to me because each of the international students talked about what the culture would have been in their country, how they would have handled this in their country. You know, do we send money? Um, no, we can't send enough money. Or, you know, how do you do this? Or maybe we should send gifts of some other sort. And it really opened my eyes to the other cultures that I was working with here on campus, and we always loved it because they would stand up in class and say, 
well in my country. And so we, a few of us tried that a few times. But it really helped me as a faculty member later on to remember that I had to learn about their culture as much as they had to learn about mine. And I think that was probably the thing that stuck with me most as a, as a doctoral student here. You know, you wonder sometimes with a group like this how many questions we'll get. And you guys are doing great. I think we can still do another student, another alumni. Pat, why don't you draw a yellow one out for us? Students, get ready. Here we go. Go ahead and hand that microphone down. Oh, it's a long question. What challenges do you think you and your fellow students are going to have to face as you enter the workforce and profession after you graduate? And how is the department preparing you to meet those challenges? Who made these questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think a major challenge for all of us here, and I think everyone here in academia can relate to this, we have a public who is increasingly leery of agriculture, of research, and of government. And that is essentially what we're all trying to do here. We're trying to bring research-based federal programming to the community, and we need to find a way to educate them without making them upset or just getting them turned off from us. And I think the department's done a great job of preparing us for this because we've had opportunities to engage in research ourselves, so we understand how it's con conducted. We've also had opportunities to read and learn about this research in our class, and I really think the fact that we've had hands-on experiences through internships and through really invested faculty the experiences they provided has allowed us to accomplish this. Anyone else? So I did not realize until just the last few years just how massive of an outreach like agriculture and Ohio, like the university have within the state. And it's just, it's insane. It's super amazing. Um, but I think just finding, because there's so many opportunities once we graduate of places to go and where we can work. And I think finding like, you know, narrowing it all down and finding that right fit <laughs> might be a little bit of a challenge just because there's, because there are so many amazing opportunities. And then also, you know, every place has its own tick. So, you know, we learn, you know, everything we can hear about, you know, the major in general. But then when we get to each individual, individual place, you know, we'll have to learn about, you know, what do they want specifically for their own company or organization. And I think the internships that we do for our major have really helped me, at least, um, kind of get the feel for that and kind of know how that works a little bit better. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to our final question. Now, this one, we're going to start at the end, the other side this time. And hopefully everyone will have an answer. And if not, that's fine. Pass the microphone down. Here's that final question. What are your hopes for the department as we enter the next 100 years? I hope that our department continues to do what it's already doing, um, that it continues to prepare our agricultural communicators, our educators, and our leaders, but it also continues to take a look around and notice the needs that need met in our society, the needs that need met in our classrooms, um, and the needs that need met in the agricultural industry, and that we continue to grow and adapt to meet those needs, um, whether it's expanding youth development opportunities in urban areas or internationally whether it's helping agriculture educators show the opportunities for technical education when it comes to seeking the potential in students, helping them find the right fit, and helping them contribute to our workforce. Um, one thing that's really unique about our department is that when we teach, when we educate, when we send graduates off into the world, they're not just making a difference for one person, but they're serving as a catalyst to make a difference for several people. Um, you think about the teachers, and the amount of students that they see graduate, the amount of students that they get to influence and that hopefully they'll be able to encourage um, the next generation of agriculturalists. And I'm just really hopeful and proud and excited to be a part of the department and excited to see what's in store. You know, that was a great answer. <laughs> but honestly, so many people, you just look around the room, everyone here is at the forefront of their field, whether they're a communicator, educator, in or a leader, whether it's in a classroom or a non-formal teaching setting. And I really think the department will continue to have that reputation and I hope we'll continue to expand it. And I think we really do have a reputation of a premier agricultural educator program. And I think our extension program is getting there. We're one of the first ones who pioneered the undergraduate and graduate majors. And I'm just excited to see how that continues to evolve throughout the years. 
Okay, so our department, I think we do like a really great job of offering opportunities both within the classroom and then outside of the classroom. And I know Mariah kind of talked about that a little bit, but um, I would love to see um, us kind of work more and like practice what we're doing um, on the regular, like on main campus and not just on the ag portion of campus um, and really kind of put to practice, you know, the education and communications and the different skills that we're learning now. I think that would be really great. I hope the department continues over the next hundred years to challenge the students to become the best that they can be, the best versions of themselves, so they can go out and make a difference in the world um, on a global scale. I think the department has an opportunity to have a national and international presence beyond even where it's at now um, in sort of eminence in its leadership and extension and ag ed education disciplines. Um, there's a lot of potential that I think in elements we're not tapping into just yet and we have the opportunity and hopefully in the next hundred years to get there. Well as a as a PhD student my perspective is a little different as many of us were that we were here for two years three years before they finally kicked us out and sent us on our way and um, so I guess my thoughts are to continue the leadership in ag education nationally and the thing I appreciate is the support that I received as an alumni. And, you know, the luncheons at, at meetings, the contacts made by faculty at various points, the congratulations when I got a promotion, the encouragement when I tried, you know, was doing research on my own after I left here. And I think that kind of, of continued support for alumni in the profession is something that they do very well or have done very well, and I hope that continues. I think uh, uh, this movement, this trend of, of distrust for science and institutions and society is, is very alarming, obviously, but there's such an opportunity because I feel like uh, there, there's, uh, there's new interest from uh, your col colleagues, our colleagues in the scientific community, in the academic community, to become better communicators and educators about science, science communications. You, you Google it, you just see a lot more attention given to that idea of helping scientists become better communicators so that we can rebuild trust in what we do. And certainly within agriculture, we felt that, that burden for some time now. And I think there's a great opportunity, especially for AgCom, but really the whole department, to really take on that mission of science education. I think in 1989, the Green Book that Dr. Warmbrode talked about or chaired that group, it was to teach all people about agriculture. And I don't think we've accomplished that. For example, at FFA camp, during the 12 weeks in the spring and the fall, we bring in for two and a half days six graders in a program called Nature's Classroom. And it's just an outstanding thing. I'm, I, we're going to the doctor now, and I'm talking to parents of kids that are being sent to our camp and great reports. This is something, number one, continue to do what you're doing, but I think an area we really have to step up, and that is to teach agriculture and what we're all about and the importance of it to all people, not just seven through high school and college. Now, kind of as a facilitator here, I didn't answer any questions until now. Those of you that know me know I'm a man of few words, so bear with me. Yeah, it doesn't get much funnier than that, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Where we're at, I mean, when you look at the past, I mean, it started in 1917 with two guys named Smith Hughes. I mean, Dr. Barrick, you remember them. But, um, <laughs> sorry. But agriculture is our lives, and education is our lives. In 1983, I became a student at New Bremen High School in agriculture education, and my teacher was Mr. Al Hoeing. He just passed away four months ago. But you know what I learned from him? It continued throughout agriculture education. And that's the two things I hope that continue the next hundred years. 
and that is servant leadership and the lifelong connection that this department has with the graduates. For four years, I had a great opportunity to be at New Bremen Agriculture. Then I had the opportunity to be a state officer and be led by Mr. Hubs and taught me so many things about what a leader should be. From there, my state FFA advisor, Mr. Davis, and then as I run for national office and become one, Mr. Scott, being able to help me through there. Then to go to Ohio State and my department chair, Dr. Barry, and going down to room 100 and seeing Dr. Newcomb and knowing his door was open to say very warm, friendly things to you. <laughs> but you know, the relationships in college, those that stood beside me when I was married were the people I met through FFA and the people I met at The Ohio State University in this department. From people like David Marison, I think still the only two-time Ag Ed Society president who was somebody that worked with me as a student to other students at Ohio State and teachers that I got to stay in touch with. Then when I became a teacher and found mentors, and some of them here tonight, Brad Moffitt, the leader of egg science education in Ohio in the 1990s, and Craig Wiggett at the Ohio Department of Education, continually calling me as a young teacher, how can we help? And young teachers, it's tough sometimes. But it's because of that connection here with agriculture education. And then when I became an administrator and be able to work with people in agriculture and the opportunity for my first hire at Butler Tech to hire Kelly Warner, who I think is one of the best three teachers Ohio has right now, and to see that growth and to still see amazing teachers that have made a difference like Bernie Scott, who is a legend in Northwest Ohio and Otsego and made a difference for hundreds of people. But it comes down to this. These people continued that relationship, continued to help support me and everyone else to be better teachers, better role models, because we learned what servant leadership is about. I tell my leadership team at Springboro, and I tell the teachers, the day of leading by fear must be over as leaders. We must learn to serve others, serve our students, serve the teachers, serve the community. And I learned that right here from people like Dr. Newcomb, Dr. Barry, Dr. McCaslin, Dr. Cano, Dr. Weddington, and Dr. Jim Papperton, who used to pull Joanne Harner and I out of the welding booth and say, listen, something's going on wrong right now. Listen, where is it? He didn't teach us how to weld. He taught us how to teach welding. When I finish speeches as a school superintendent, I end with this. It's not how long you live your life that counts how you live your life during the time that God has given you that really makes a difference. Those of you in the room that made a difference for me, thank you. But all of you are teachers, you're educators, you're making a difference every day. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Dr. Kitchell, back to you. As they leave the stage, join me one more time in thanking our group of students and alumni. We've talked about the past, we've talked about the present, and now I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the future. Our strategic plan outlines our goals for the next five years, our first five years in a brand new century in the department. And so we have four main pillars or areas that we'll be focusing in over the next 100 years. Communication and leadership outreach, increased research portfolio, excellence in teaching and academic programs, and a commitment to diversity and inclusion. For the first column, communication and leadership outreach, we're currently undergoing a strategic planning process for the OSU Leadership Center, which is now a part of our department. Our department inherited the center about five years ago, and now we're, now we're seeing how we can leverage this center as an integral part of how we study and teach leadership. And not just leadership, but leadership very broadly defined, and that encompasses communication. 
So Jeff King, who's in community leadership, and Emily Buck and AgCom are now co-directing that center toward that end. The second column focuses on research. We're a, we are at a land-grant, research-extensive university. And not just any land-grant, research-extensive university, but one with a premier, world-renowned reputation. Our department's scholarship plays a role in telling the story about how people interact with agriculture and how they interact with each other in and about agriculture. We plan to find ways of being more relevant on this front at Ohio State. The third column focuses on teaching, learning, and academic programs. In the near future, our focus will be on resurrecting our advisory committee and engaging our stakeholders to ensure we're producing graduates not just for today, but graduates who will be relevant for tomorrow. Finally, we've chosen to focus on diversity and inclusion, and our focus in this area is simple. We feel that everyone deserves a place at the ACEL table. More practically, our students need to engage with people who are different than themselves. We have a population of people who are more interested in food and food production than ever before, yet are least connected to that production than in previous generations. If we are going to engage with people, we need to be prepared to engage with all types of people in our profession. And when we do, we will be stronger for it. And there's research to back that up. Outside the confines of our strategic plan, we are going to be renovating the majority of our space in agricultural administration. And you may have seen the, the diagram in the hallway and some of you are like, okay, so where's the, where's the chair's office now and what does that look like? So uh, outside, uh, so as, as you take a look, um, you, you'll see the Mac Lab in the corner. That's the current chair's office. You'll see where Chadwick Arboretum is there at the top. So that's the north and then the ag admin parking lot. So uh, when I say that we're being gutted, we, it, walls are coming down. Um, it is completely being gutted. The entire north wing from rooms 201 to 214 will be blown out. And in addition to the new faculty and staff suite with collaborative central working space, our classroom and teaching lab will go from 24 to 35 seats featuring a training lab in sync for our agri-science education and our non-formal science education efforts. An observation room to the side of that for, for those who need to do faculty on teaching and learning. Our computer lab or our Mac lab will go from 24, what I'll say is cramped um, Macintosh computers that kind of overlap each other to with 24 permanent Macs with six additional laptop seating swing spaces. Our conference room will have better acoustics for our distance meetings, uh, defenses, and student organization meetings. And all three of those major spaces will have new technology to allow for easier distance connections and lecturing cap uh, lecture capturing capabilities. We're excited that about this new space that starts that will be finished by autumn 2018. By December of this year, we will be working out of the fourth floor. Did you know there was a fourth floor to Agat Men? <laughs> We'll be at working out of the fourth floor of Ag Admin in what we have called Camp A Cell, uh, as we will be sharing offices until the completion of the renovation. And so my thanks to the college, because they're the ones who are investing the, the money for our renovation. So now it's my pleasure to debut our centennial video. Our video tells the bigger story of our students, alumni, and faculty, and how cultivating futures is brought to life. The video will seem quick, but within that five minutes, it's broken up into chapters based upon the collection of the responses of those who have participated. We have approximately somewhere around 350, 400 minutes of video that was condensed down to five. And so my thanks to those of you who provided content for that video, and, and I appreciate that. Um, so if you were part of that video recording, will you please stand at this time? Those of you who were, help me in thanking the folks who were part of that video. Now, now here's the bad news. Even though not everybody made the final cut, again, 350 minutes down to five, uh, the comments from all involved were very heartwarming, and I think you'll see that come out in the video. Our plan is to utilize the additional footage for other kinds of opportunities to talk about the department. So if you don't see yourself today, you will probably see yourself later. Um, and so at this point, I bring you the Centennial video. 
The foundations of the department back in 1917 really were around preparing vocational agriculture teachers. We taught problem solving from day one. And then in the late 60s, we started agricultural communication. I think our department's doing a good job of trying to stay on pace with how fast communication is already developing in our world. Around 2012, we started into community leadership. And we went back to the roots of our discipline and the basic tenets and decided, what do we still believe in? And philosophically, what are we still committed to? And therefore, what are we going to use as the foundation from which we will rebuild what we believe will be the best curriculum. The evolution of us being agricultural education is really more about thinking broader than the production of food, but the whole process that it takes to get food from the farm to the plate. This department puts a lot of emphasis on students taking external experiences. So whether that's an internship or a job or a study abroad type of experiencing, expanding our horizons beyond just the classrooms here at Ohio State. We need to be broadly educated to know about the social, the political, the arts and history such that we can interact with, we can participate in the culture and the world in which we work. I actually was personally able through my internship that I was doing, was able to travel uh, and take some students, actually high school students, to Ghana, West Africa. And, and that experience there and seeing how food connects people, not only just in what they eat, but just connecting to your health care and to economics, just all of that and how it intertwines in so many parts of our, our lives. I became exposed to things that I had never seen, never understood, and I became uncomfortable. And as a result of that, I was challenged. The professors in our department have a true love for agricultural education. Working with my academic advisor solidified the pathway in the department and my future career. My professor here at the time, Dr. Kurt Paulson, uh, if it wasn't for him, uh, encouraging me to put together a resume that he then circulated in Washington, D.C., I never would have had an internship there, uh, and which, which completely put me on the path to my career. This department has really helped me to kind of be in a position to do what I think you helped me to address the problems that I saw back home. You're not gonna have better advisors than what this department has. They really care for you, and I think that they really help you not only get to your end goal, but they know the steps to take to be able to get there too. They want you to succeed, and they really drive you to succeed, and they won't stop until you do succeed. Once I made the decision that I wanted to be a 4-H educator, it was very clear for me to attend this university, this college, this department. Many universities will have an agricultural education component, but this whole community leadership and specific in leadership or extension component is new. The great thing about this department is there's so much freedom and so much flexibility. It really empowers you to create your own. The opportunities are endless because of the need we have to feed a hungry world, provide safe food for the consumers. You know, that mission is as central now as it's ever been, and the college is well positioned to provide that workforce to deliver that. The biggest thing I took away, biggest thing, life is about relationships. There's a whole world out there of, of connections that you make, and the folks that I went to school with, I continue to work with in a number of capacities. There is definitely a special bond of people who've come through this department. We talked about working on issues and working on projects together as students, and now we're working on things that we know have an impact in our state, uh, our communities, uh, and nationally. Uh, and that's, that's very rewarding for us and uh, something that's special that came out of this department. Cultivating Futures is about the people that were, are, and are going to be here. I really am where I'm supposed to be uh, in the ACL department. It gives you a strong foundation for just about any career that you want to go into. Well, I think this department uh, has a, a bright future. We're building leaders in this department. Ohio State is the college to go to if you want to major in ag education. I got eager to, to, to teach. 
I hope that I can do half as much as my teachers did for me. When I look at the next hundred years, that's what really excites me. They change your life while you're here for those four years. This department sets you up for greatness. I really feel touched by the opportunity to have been a part of what I consider a pretty special place. Well, what a wonderful evening this has been, and what a great job that Dr. Kitchell and the faculty and staff in ACL have done to put together the entire celebration. Let's show them our appreciation. <laughs> you know, just like all of you, any success that I've enjoyed in my career is due in large measure to the fact that I am a graduate of The Ohio State University in agricultural education. The faculty we had the privilege of learning, with over, learning from over the years, whether it was 50 years ago or just last week, has provided us with a firm foundation in whatever career pathway we've chosen. ACEL has been and continues to be a shining star in the college at OSU, across the country and around the world. And as Dr. Wormbrod just said in the video, ACEL has a bright future. I've had the privilege of working at three major land-grant universities, all of them with large enrollments and a diversity of programs. My loyalty has always been to the scarlet and gray, even during those years that I had to wear orange and blue. <laughs> Although colors and mascots and locations may differ considerably, they all share a common concern, the lack of financial support from the state. Appropriation levels for state-assisted universities have dropped to well below 20% of the annual budget. And we strive to keep tuition at an affordable level. After all, we are a land-grant university, university of the children for the common people. So where do we get our funding to make up this void? Some would offer it perhaps through contracts and grants. Well, that's a good idea, but grants come with strings attached, work to be done, not general support. There's little support for the academic mission of university through grants. Rarely does USDA, the Ag Experiment Station, NSF, NIH, and the like provide any funding for teaching and learning. That leaves one very important source of financial support for our university and for this department, us, us. Private gifts from alumni and friends of ACEL who are willing to step up and ensure that the department does continue to prosper. When Dr. Susie Whittington and I were asked to chair the development committee for the Celebrating Futures effort, we readily agreed. And by the way, you saw Dr. Whittington on the video. She's not here this evening. Her husband, Dr. Pat Whittington, is receiving the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at the University of Idaho this weekend. So Susie is with Pat in Moscow, the, the one in Idaho. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tonight, we launch the Centennial Campaign Funding for ACEL. As several of us collaborated in determining the proposed use of the funds, the bottom line is simple to support student learning. Whether it's a scholarship fund and direct support or program enhancement or faculty development, the revenue from this new endowment will drive student development activities. Admittedly, we've set a lofty goal, $2 million, which will generate about $80,000 annually every year for varied programs. But we know it's reachable. And we are off to a great start. To reach that goal, gifts would need to average about $1,000 per alumnus. But like Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobegon, all of our alumni are above average. 
So we know that, th <laughs> thank you very much. So we know that $2 million really is within reach over time. During this quiet phase of the campaign, we've contacted a few alumni to help us establish the endowed fund and to get us started off on the right foot. We extend a hearty thank you to those who've already stepped forward with a pledge or gift. You see their names on the screen like right now. There they are. <coughs> along with those who also contributed to the Centennial Planning Fund under the direction of then department chair, Gary Strachwadoon. So these are early adopters and early adapters, and we appreciate that. And we are now at a fund total of $106,000. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So tonight we launch the Centennial Campaign. It's our hope that you will join those who have already made a financial commitment by giving to the ACL department in this meaningful and historic way. We'll never have another Centennial. So this is our chance to make it a celebration for all to remember. And with your support, we will make it happen. Uh, you've probably already noticed the gift forms that were at your tables <laughs> this evening. <laughs> Somewhat subtle, not. <laughs> Let's take a look at the form and see what a gift really could be. Well, first of all, this is an effort to establish and build an endowment, as I mentioned before. An endowment is forever. I encourage you to be thoughtful and to dig deep into your pockets as you consider how we can support ACEL for the next century and beyond. And then from a practical standpoint, if you could give $100 tonight, then consider making a commitment of $100 each year over the next five years. Or maybe it's $500 a year, or perhaps $1,000 a year. Now, five years can seem like a long time, but for a fund that will be here long after all of us are gone, five years is a relatively short time for us to make a commitment to ACEL. There are, of course, several ways to indicate our commitment. Cash, credit card, even transferring deferred interest annuities directly to the fund without a tax liability if you're in the right age group, <laughs> all are possibilities. Only you can make that decision, and only you can decide what gift you can make. Thank you. Thank you for your loyalty over the years. Thank you for your consideration and helping us ensure an even brighter future for our academic home. And go Bucks. At this time, I welcome back Dr. Kitchell and our student narrators as we end our evening together. We, we do have two items of business before we end our wonderful evening together. First, a toast. So if you please would all grab a glass of sparkling juice as it comes around. Ooh. Ooh. Get a little excited, everyone. There's coming on on the other side. <laughs> all right, if everyone would please grab a glass. A toast. A toast to our humble beginnings of preparing vocational agriculture teachers. A toast to our expansion into extension education and community leadership as fields of study. A toast to the inclusion of agricultural communication to connect our industry with the broader population. And to the future, may we continue to cultivate our future and the future of our students and those in our industry and profession. Cheers.
Thank you, everyone. And as always, in a time-honored tradition, please gather around with others and let's sing Carmen, Ohio. The words are printed on the back of your 100 booklets if needed. Oh, sing Ohio's praise and songs to Thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate you coming and celebrating our 100 years of our department. As you leave, please grab your commemorative candy jar and in the lobby, please fill it up with candy. Thank you everyone for coming and as always, Go Bucks! <laughs>